Hey guys, it's Mrs. Olenichek, and today we're going to talk all about genetics. Um, well, as we go through, there's going to be a ton of vocabulary, so make sure you're aware of it. Make sure any new words that you're able to define, write down the definition, put it in your own words. One of those words is trait. So genetics is basically a study of how traits are passed from parents to offspring. Throughout time, we've noticed that offspring or children tend to look like their parents. And so genetics is looking at how those offspring get those traits. Um, those traits can be things like the ability to roll your tongue, whether or not you have dimples, the cleft chin, or even the color or texture of your hair. Um, these are all passed on from your parents to offspring. So traits are determined by genes that are located on chromosomes. So a gene is just a segment of DNA that determines a trait. So in each and every one of your chromosomes, you have multiple genes that code for many different traits. Now we're going to pause for a second and think back to meiosis. Um, meiosis, this process of creating gametes, that are haploid, having half the chromosome number, is going to be really important in understanding how traits get passed from parents to offspring. So remember when we went through this, we said that in order to make sperm, if you're a male, or eggs, if you're a female, you go through this special cell division called meiosis. And the result being these haploid gametes, these cells that have half the chromosome number. And these are what gets passed on to offspring. Um, it's also important to note this idea of independent assortment, that genes and chromosomes are in inherited independently of each other. So just because you inherit this particular chromosome has no impact on which of these two chromosomes you're going to inherit. Um, and so it's pretty random how they um, allocate themselves in these different gametes. Um, and now we come back to Mendel. So one of Mendel's major principles or important discoveries was this idea of independent assortment. So genes for different traits can segregate independently during the formation of gametes. And so you inherit genes or chromosomes independently from each other. Um, now, of course, Mendel had no idea about chromosomes or any of the genetics of it, he just noticed um, traits and the idea that they were inherited independently. Um, you also get to this idea of segregation or separation. So when gametes are formed, traits found on different chromosomes are going to separate from each other and so you're going to inherit them separately. Um, and which one you get is really random. All right, so some more vocabulary. Hopefully you can read that. It says chromosomes come in homologous pairs or genes come in pairs. So homologous, if you can't read it up here, it's right here, homologous. H-O-M-O-L-O-G-O-U-S. Um, and so a homologous chromosome, those are genes that code for the same trait. Now they're not exactly the same. Remember we said homologous chromosomes are kind of like your shoes. Um, they're similar, you use them for the same things, you need both of them, but they're not exactly the same necessarily. Um, homologous pairs, one you get from mom and one you get from dad. So in humans we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. One set from dad, 23 and one set for mom. Um, these homologous chromosomes, like I said, they come in, they have different versions for particular genes. Um, and we call those versions of a gene alleles. Um, so for example, if the trait were eye color, you could have an allele, a version of that trait for blue eyes, or a version of that trait for brown eyes. And if we're talking about genes, what we're really talking about is different proteins. Um, so a protein that would result in brown eyes or a protein that would result in blue eyes. 
Um, just an aside, eye color is actually influenced by multiple genes, and so that's why you have different shades and different inheritance patterns. But to keep it simple, we usually talk about brown and blue in the beginning, and then we'll make it more complicated later. Um, so now we come to dominant and recessive genes. So a gene that prevents another gene from showing when it's present is said to be dominant. It dominates the expression. Um, and the gene that doesn't show unless both alleles, so the one you got from mom and the one you got from dad, are this recessive allele, we call recessive. Um, when we use symbols to represent this, we have uppercase letters re representing our dominant gene and lowercase for the recessive. Um, so in this picture, black fur color is going to be dominant, the dominant trait whereas white would be the recessive trait. So another example is hitchhiker's thumb. So I want you to look at your thumb now and see if you have a hitchhiker's thumb. If you do, it's a recessive trait and that means that you got the recessive allele for hitchhiker's thumb from both of your parents. If you don't, you're showing the dominant trait and you could either be big T, big T, or big T, little t. Um, but you're going to show that trait either way. And when we represent this, remember you're going to use the same letter for both alleles. Um, so you would do an S and an H. And you also want to think about your letters. Make sure they're letters that are going to look different in the upper and lower case. It's really easy to mix up a big S and a little S. So think about that. Um, so the genes that somebody with a straight thumb could have, like I said before, you could have two dominant alleles or you could have one dominant and one recessive, but you're still going to show the same expression. If you have Hitchhiker's thumb, though, like this, then we know that you get two of the recessive alleles. So a little bit more vocabulary. If both of the genes of a pair are the same, so both alleles are either dominant or recessive, we say that you're homozygous or purebred. Remember, homo means same. Um, so you could be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. However, if one dominant and you have one dominant and one recessive gene, then we say you're heterozygous. You also sometimes call these individuals hybrids. And so if you have a dominant and a recessive allele, then we say you're heterozygous. Remember, hetero other. All right, so genotype and phenotype. Combination of genes in an organism. So the actual genes, the genetic makeup, what alleles they have on the inside, we call the genotype. So if you're homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive, that's your genotype. The expression of those genes is called your phenotype. It's the physical appearance. What do you see? Um, and so in our example of hitchhiker's thumb, whether or not you have a hitchhiker's thumb or a straight thumb would be your phenotype. Now we get to our Punnett squares. So Punnett squares are used to predict the possible outcomes of um, offspring. Um, so it really is just a prediction and you're looking for probabilities. It's not saying that if you have four offspring they're necessarily going to match this. Um, it's just predicting what the possible outcomes could be. Um, so if black fur is dominant to white fur in mice, and you cross a heterozygous male with a homozygous recessive female. That means you have a big B, little b for the male, and little b, little b for the female. We want to predict what kind of offspring they have. And so you write out your cross. You have heterozygous, big B, little b, crossed with homozygous recessive, little b, little b. Um, for a Punnett square, you're going to write out the possible gametes. So remember, you can only pass on half of your alleles. 
And so dad can either contribute a dominant allele or a recessive, whereas mom can only contribute recessive alleles. Um, so once you've done that and you've set up showing on either side of your Punnett square the possible gametes, then you're going to put in the combinations. And it's a lot, so this is the result of meiosis, right? These are the possible gametes. And this right here are the possible fertilization events. So these are the possible offspring. Um, and when you talk about that, you then want to represent your gen possible genotypes and possible phenotypes. So the possible genotypes here, you could have two heterozygous and two homozygous recessive. The phenotype, so 50% would be heterozygous, 50% would be homozygous recessive. Your phenotypes is what are you going to see? Well, half of the, the offspring are going to be black and the other half would be white. Here, if we crossed two hybrid mice and give them the genotypic ratio and phenotypic ratio. So if you want to press pause and try this on your own before you watch me go through it, that would be a great idea. Um, so here you have two hybrid mice, so they're heterozygous, big B, little b. And so dad can contribute either a big B or a little b. Mom is the same big B or a little b. And so now we just put them together kind of like a multiplication table. Um, and we find that the genotypic ratio of the offspring are going to be one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. Um, and you can do that in percentages as well. The phenotypic ratio would be three black to, to one white or 75% black and 25% white. All right, here's another one. A man and a woman, both with brown eyes, marry and have a blue-eyed child. What are the genotypes of the man, woman, and child? Well, this one's a little bit trickier, right? So based solely on phenotype, the only one that we're positive of is going to be the child, right? Because we know in order to be blue-eyed, you'd have to be homozygous recessive. And the only way that could happen is if both parents contributed a little b. Since parents are also brown-eyed, so we know they have at least one dominant allele, they must both be heterozygous. And you're going to want to prove that by making your Punnett square and then showing that this is the only way you would possibly get that phenotype. Um, we can also do something we call a dihybrid cross. So these involve two traits and looking at them both at the same time. Um, here again, you're just going to separate out and figure out the possible gametes. Now this one's a little bit trickier and we'll go over this together in class as well. So if you don't get it right away, don't worry. Um, but here I'm just trying to figure out all the possible combinations in the sperm and egg of these individuals. So how many different ways can I combine these letters? Um, so I could have the big B and the big H, big B and little h little b and big H, little b and little h. Um, you can try FOIL if that makes it easier for you, that first, outer, inner, last. Um, and you get the same combinations for mom. Um, and here we just line this up the same way we did before. And you'll notice I'm going to look at the first trait first, so I'll combine my B's and then I combine my H's. And so you go through and do the same thing that you did before. Now that I've gone through all of this, I can then analyze the data, so look at the genotypes and figure out the phenotypes, and you're going to get what we call a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Um, and anytime you cross two dihybrids, so two hybrids, this is the ratio you're going to get. Um, you can do this for multiple traits, and you don't always have to make that big, huge um, Punnett square, here there's only two possibilities and one possibility of phenotype.
Um, so I want you to practice on your own now, um, and we'll go over all of your answers together in class tomorrow. Bye.